The laws of life to achieve prosperity, success, and happiness in my life. My first steps. Hello, welcome to Total History, your history and culture channel. For best results use headphones. Today I present you my reflections on the laws of life to reach prosperity, success and happiness in my life. My first steps. You can listen to it while walking, exercising, riding the subway, riding the bus, or simply getting comfortable, closing your eyes, meditating or enjoying the content. Important note, this video is edited in black screen so in case you want to use it as a means of meditation you can do it completely in the dark. I understand that the content you are about to hear is complex but it is intended to help you glimpse new perspectives of development in your life, or of life. You can listen to it as many times as you like so that you can grasp the depth and essence of the message. In this academically rigorous dissertation you will learn how to start your path to success, prosperity, and happiness through your own mental projection in a journey through wisdom in which you will be the protagonist. For this to be possible, you will first prepare your mind to be able to assume a deep, lasting and comprehensive learning, empowering your brain to reach the maximum potential of understanding. Through this visualization journey you will access your subconscious mind to develop the necessary conditions to reach the state of maximum learning, by looking at yourself and your current circumstances to transcend into the successful, abundant and happy person you want to be. To begin your own journey through your inner self, in which the protagonist is you, you must understand that your brain does not distinguish between an imagined event and a real one and that the experience you are going to live will be for you a real experience. You are the builder, the mastermind, the magician, the genius, the creator. Understand that, if you imagine something in your mind, your brain assumes that you have really experienced what you were imagining, and this is how you create new neural interconnections that are stored, becoming more and more complex your neural network, which ultimately is about your own self, your concepts and the scope of the universe known and to be known. Let's begin. Calm down, take a breath, put aside the stress and problems that surround you, relax and listen carefully. Consider that today is not one more day of your life, or one less day of your life depending on how you see it or how you want to count it, your life, which is one, which is for life and which is yours alone, is nothing more than the sum of all the days lived in your life for you. Allow me from now on, as far as possible, to speak in the first person, because from now on this reflection is only for you. So I no longer ask myself with uncertainty, with the distance of a being external to me, how will my day be? Well, my day today, and tomorrow, and every day will be as I want it to be because I am in control of my life, of which I am the protagonist and because my life is mine. It is so mine that in fact it is the only thing that really belongs to me in life. Therefore, there is no need for me to feel disappointed, oppressed, or minimized by anyone or anything. I am going to refer in this reflection exclusively to the sadness that emanates from the material, from the mundane, from that which we believe to be important but does not compare with what is truly important, for the only important thing is life. According to Boethius, whoever wants to remember his Libyan dates, and I clarify the term Libyan dates in the sense of referring to questions of little weight, of actions derived from inconstancy that make us change our thoughts easily, due to the fragility of having weak pillars of support of the important and fundamental things, which finally, generates us to mistakenly give importance to the less important as important. Well, Boethius said, whoever wishes to remember their lightness will understand the sad result of pleasures. If they could provide happiness, nothing would prevent the beasts from being blessed. End of quote. Therefore, Sadness and anguish that comes from the material or conceptual, as an artificial construct in our mind, is not something natural, because it is an alteration of the natural state of feeling joyful, happy, grateful for life. 
And I understand that sadness is not natural, inasmuch as, if an affection is understood as something that is capable of affecting, of altering the qualities of something else, as for example white, regardless of the quantity, it alters black, heat also alters cold, envy alters love, etc. So that the act of feeling sadness, disappointment, misfortune and other sorrows is an alteration of the natural state of my happiness, for I as a human being by nature tend toward the infinity of good things, that is, I tend toward infinite happiness. Thus, sorrow and discouragement by themselves, are nothing more than an affection that alters or changes my natural state of happiness, without forgetting that this negative state is the result of my deep decision to feel this way, because I understand that what I really need and thirst for is success, good health, prosperity, and joy in life. Following the parameter by which the human being is understood as a being that tends towards infinity in his thirst to know, to know more and more, because the more he knows the more he wants to know, I understand that the more I know happiness, the more I will want it, the more I know success, the more I will want it, the more I know the good, the more I will seek it, as it happens with all those things that are inherent to me as a human being by nature, because no one loves what he does not know. And so it is that I immediately understand that the first step to achieve prosperity, success, happiness, is to be aware that I know that I know, not the academic or formal concept of the terms, but the feeling of feeling like that which I intend to achieve. It is from this perspective that in a natural, simple, automatic way, I deduce that both success and happiness are natural conditions of humanity, it is proven that it is healthier and easier to smile than to frown, although it is true that the habit dragged by bad habits of thinking and acting in an unnatural sense in our being in the key of negativity, becomes a condition, in many cases serious, in the same way that an incorrect way of sitting turned into a habit will affect the spine, or that a way of holding a musical instrument, which may seem simpler than the correct way, because we have become accustomed to it, will prevent us from reaching the maximum performance of the instrument itself, as well as the excellence of the musical piece conceived to be played on it, because the correct way will always be the easiest and will be the one that will take me without any doubt, from mediocrity to the sublime. Therefore, if the right thing is that which is free of errors or defects, it is not right for me to accept the less for the more, so I accept from now on, that I am a being full of life, full of health, full of success, full of prosperity and flooded with happiness, because it is so, because I want it so, because it has to be so, because it is what is natural in me. I will not be the fruit of bad habits acquired consciously or unconsciously that will generate in me, if they have already done so, a feeling of dissatisfaction that hides in the appearance of feeling satisfied with less than what I deserve. Therefore, I conceive that I can have prosperity, well-being and bonanza no matter what my present circumstances are, and that I can enjoy good health and fitness, and that I can have the happy life I want, because I deserve it. And it is at this point that I ask myself, how is it that I deserve it, do I deserve what I deserve? And I answer myself. I do not deserve how much I try to deserve, that is, I do not deserve for the desire I have to deserve or the efforts I make to deserve, because the amount of merit resides in the intensity of my acts, of my actions, in such a way that I understand that when I am able to convert the intention, the desire, the effort, the yearning, to deserve in the act of deserving, then will be the moment when I will deserve what I deserve, because the act of deserving, or deserving in act and not in potency, supposes the action to which will correspond a reaction with equal force and intensity to that act. In this sense I am able to rise to the level where I recognize that besides deserving by my acts, I also deserve by the principle of deserving, thus, in the same way that I speak by the faculty of exercising speech, I deserve by the faculty of exercising my good virtues and my good habits, which in the end will become good acts that have an impact, my deserving being of the same size as my acts are. Therefore, believe, 
feel, live and act deserving what you deserve. And at this point I consider thinking of a good house of my own, mine, to my liking. A house that I visualize in detail. Well, what if now I think that I deserve an even better one and I visualize it? Without fear, without barriers that prevent the big or the luxurious. Because that house is the one I truly deserve. If you were asked, what car do you like? Automatically your imagination, fruit of the perceptions of reality that have reached your intelligence, would present you the car immediately, in fact, you are already seeing it, it has already taken shape in your mind, you already have it in you. Notice how from the outside the car matter has become part of your matter within you. It is now, from the inside out, and not from the outside in that you can say to yourself. I am visualizing it, I see the color, I see the inside, I see myself in front of the steering wheel, I feel the smell of the new car, my new car, and now I realize without affection and without fear, that this car is the one I deserve, and I drive it, because this car is mine. You can become your own master, your own guide to trust, but to do this you must definitely take the reins of your own destiny and steer yourself boldly and firmly towards the place you intend to get to. My journey has already begun, my present I transfigure it, I intentionally change it to be the beginning of the end of the road because I am aware that with what I have done so far, letting things flow without control, results in a feeling of being trapped and without escape, and that furthermore, in that way, nothing will appear unless I exert myself, nothing will appear unless I exercise my free will to gain control, for without my intervention these things will not improve on their own, for they lack the proper movement to move where I want them to go, for I am aware that the movement, the fluidity, the path, is given and directed by me. I lead, I guide, I am the builder of my destiny because I am in tune with the law of life to be able to change my own current conditions of life, because only I know the way to do it, because I also understand that, otherwise, the years will pass too fast leaving me finally just in the current situation, and by omission, by not intervening, by not taking control, my conditions may possibly get worse. There are no limits or boundaries to the outcome of thought, whether for good or ill. But how do I get in tune with the law of life? How do I make everything flow? The first thing I have to do is to know these laws and then pass the exterior reality to my interior to change it to my liking, mold it in my way, and then see how they return to the exterior once molded by me. The reality of my present is the fruit and consequences of my past actions, and I know that it hurts me to recognize it, but when I look, I find, even if it is painful for me, that is how it was, it has already happened, it is no longer, and accepting it leads me to recognize with humility, before myself, without shame, that I have been the cause of all the consequences. In the same way, as far as the future is concerned, I am now, in my present, the cause of my future consequences, with the difference with respect to the past that now I know it, and as I know it I understand that the owner of my future is me, and nobody else, nobody or nothing from outside can intervene within me as I do, because I am who I am and I am also who I want to be, and in the same way, by the same principle, who I want to be, I am also me. And I am going to demonstrate this to myself next through the laws of life, because now I understand that to learn is to discover what I already knew. First Law The Law of Mentalism is based on the statement that everything is mind, the universe is a mental creation. According to this law everything we live is a mental creation that expresses itself in a physical form with good and bad facts that arise from ourselves. But let us focus only on the universe from the human perspective, that is, the universe from the inside out. Let's see. What was the universe of a human being 40,000 years ago? When they painted in the caves, their universe was limited to animals, 
hunting actions, we are talking about 20, maybe 30 kilometers of space, those who were able to travel, that was all in the best case. Let's take another example. A pet, a rabbit that lives free in our house that we feed, we give affection, we pamper it, and that we know that outside in the wild, after having lived in a protected environment its life would be in serious danger. For that rabbit, the space of the house, the furniture, its hiding places, are the whole universe that exists, outside the entrance door to the home there is nothing. This refers to the spatial universe, of space, and it is simple to understand, but it also extends to the circumstantial or spatial universe in the same way. Let's see, what is my concept of the universe? Is it the one I have been taught in school, on the news, on the Hubble telescope or the James Webb, is that all? It is less than 1% of what can be seen, that is, only what the eye can grasp, that cannot be the universe, that is only what my eyes grasp. If our knowledge depends on sensible perception, and the ideas we form derive from our experience through the senses, then sensible perception, that which emanates from my senses, is that which I internalize, and if I internalize the universe within me, I can perfectly well assume that the universe is part of me, just as I am part of the universe. For all those components which are parts and into which the whole is divided, are subsequent to it, therefore the universe is me, and I am. This explains the law of mentalism according to which what we live is a mental creation that expresses itself in a physical form with good and bad facts that arise from ourselves. Let us continue with the second law. The law of correspondence. The law of correspondence is manifested through the statement, as above so below, so below so above. According to this law life manifests on the physical plane, the mental plane and the spiritual plane. Therefore, the outer world is a projection of what we feel internally. As above is below, so below is above, without is within, so within is without, and the outer world is the inner world, as the inner world is the outer world. The content has the form of the container, the water has no form, but the water in the bottle has the form of the bottle, and being that nothing prevents, in fact, that something is container and content in different ways, because if the water is in a jar, the essence of the water does not change, but if the form and function of the container, in the same way the exterior, the circumstances, are adapted to the interior of the one who contains them, which means that it can be changed. Matter in this case, I as continent, am the way of being, as being, that makes me what I am and not something else, and it is inactive, I am like that. But nevertheless the form is active, thus my interior is what gives form to the exterior, and I can shape it, that is, I as a continent can change the form of the continent, because the continent is me, and thus, making the form that the exterior receives change, is how I can manage to change the exterior, since that change supposes being another as another in me, because to shape the exterior I first have to shape the interior where it will be in my form, in my image and likeness. Therefore, now I understand that indeed the external world is a projection of what we feel internally. Next Law The Law of Vibration The Law of Vibration is based on the famous phrase nothing stands still. This law goes hand in hand with the law of attraction, since both are based on positive thoughts or vibrations for general frequencies. Thus, when we vibrate positively and control the thoughts of our mind towards what we want in our life we will obtain opportunities that allow us to move towards our goals. Let's see what this law means. Does everything changes as Heraclitus said, or is change only an illusion of the senses? as Parmenides affirmed. For Aristotle, change is not a mere appearance or illusion, but really exists. To explain this Aristotle resorted to the metaphysical principles of act and potency. According to Aristotle, all change implies the passage from potency to act. 
And what do these concepts mean? The act means the being already realized, that is, that which a being already is at a certain moment. For example, a seed is a seed in act and is in potency to become a tree, a child is a child in act, but is in potency to become a man. Potency means that which at that moment is not, but which can become. In other words, potency is a simple possibility for something to become something else, or to undergo a change, however simple it may be. Potency is related to the nature of beings, for example, a dog has no power to fly, a man has no power to run more than 200 kilometers per hour. The nature of each one limits his own possibilities. So, I am in potency right now to be whatever I want, of course within the limits of my essence as a human being, I may want to be a chicken, but I do not have the essence of a chicken, therefore, my essence is what it is, and I cannot change it, but as far as my essence as a human being is concerned I am in potency to be whatever I want. This means that I am now in act of what I am now but I am in potency of an infinite range of possible possibilities to be or to be as I want to be or to be, and when I say possible possibilities, it is understood that something by the fact of being possible is possible. In such a way that the passage from potency to act indicates movement, therefore, if the law of vibration is based on the famous phrase nothing is immobile, since everything is in constant movement in the universe, what I cannot do is to remain immobile accepting to be and to have in act what I am now and have now, knowing that in potency I am rich, happy and successful in the absence of the necessary movement to pass from potency to act. Next Law The Law of Polarity The Law of Polarity explains that everything has its pair of opposites, everything is dual, everything has two poles, the similar and the antagonistic are the same, the opposites are identical, but different in degree, the extremes touch. An example to understand this law is that no one can recognize joy and happiness if he does not know what sadness and unhappiness are like. Light cannot be experienced as such if you do not know what darkness is. To feel successful, you must have an idea of what failure is. So that the experience of one implies the knowledge of the other. In this sense I can say that there is good, and that there is also evil as its opposite, from this perspective, duality would be a simple thing, however, what if I posit that evil is nothing more than the absence of good? I am not denying evil, I am simply opening the possibilities to understand that the circumstances of poverty, sadness or unhappiness that I am experiencing today, are the product of the absence of good. That your appetite is diverted towards evil, happens because of some corruption or disorder in one of the human principles. Therefore, I who by nature tend toward the infinite will tend toward fullness, and fullness is in the greatest amount of good, and not in its absence, for my reason indicates to me that I crave good and shun evil, moreover, if I am the universe because I am part of it, and the universe in its nature is good, because everything that exists in the universe is the fruit of the maximum good that gives its existence as something good by the fact of being, and it is this same reason that makes me understand that duality consists in the choice of the best good for me and for others through my acts, both in act and in potency, so as to be in the possibility of filling myself with fullness and not with absence, so that even during the course of the movement of transformation of my being towards the being that I wish to become, I am not prevented by the opposite extreme. Next Law The Law of Rhythm Law of Rhythm, according to this law, everything ebbs and flows. There are things that advance and recede, because when we apply the above laws everything comes in its proper time. Everything ebbs and flows, everything has its advance and its retreat, everything ascends and descends, everything moves like a pendulum, the measure of its movement to the right is the same as that of its movement to the left. Rhythm is its compensation. So it is with the movement of the galaxies, of the planets, of the seasons, of the tides, 
of the heartbeat, of breathing, of thoughts, of consciousness. There is nothing lasting, everything changes constantly, and yet everything has to return to its place sooner or later. At its rhythm. My natural state is the state of happiness, my natural state is that of abundance because the universe overflows with abundance. If I can adapt to change and find my own rhythm, harmonious with the rhythm of everything around me, then I will be like water, which flows and adapts to the landscape it flows through without losing its character and strength. I cannot resist the law of rhythm and neither can I change the cycles, but I can learn to flow with it, understanding in this harmonic flow of my being with the nature that surrounds me that there is a time for all things and that everything comes at the right moment and that my moment always is and will be now, because what is to come will always have a beginning, it only depends on me that the beginning is now. Next Law The Law of Cause and Effect The law of cause and effect is one of the best known laws within these principles, because as its premise says, every cause has its effect, every effect has its cause. Without further explanation, this law emphasizes that everything we do has consequences. I already know the consequences of my current situation because I experience them, because I perceive them, because I see them. As far as the causes are concerned, I also understand that they are various, complex and interrelated, and I understand that to understand them again I have to start from the knowledge of the object, and then approach it and understand it in such a way that the object becomes part of me, the subject. Therefore, what kind of causes have caused the causes of my consequences? Or in other words, what is the primordial cause that has caused everything? And I ask myself this question because I sense that the answer will give me many clues in my intention to become the person I want. There are only four types of causes, and all the others are either these or are derived from these. As for Aristotle, for St. Thomas Aquinas, metaphysics, let us call metaphysics wisdom, is the science of being as being and, as such, the science of the first causes and principles of being. Aristotle affirmed that there are four causes, formal, material, efficient and final. Let us see. My material cause, as a human being, is the physical matter of which I am made, my matter. My efficient cause resides in the one who has made being or movement possible. I as a human being would not exist without my parents. My final cause, which is the objective of the I being or being me, and completely determines the being of my being. But let us focus only on the final cause, which seems the most interesting. Aristotle said that causal chains cannot be infinite, that is, we cannot go crazy saying the cause of this is that and the cause of that is the other infinitely, it would not make sense, therefore, there must be a first cause of all other causes. Well, well we accept that there must be a first cause to avoid the infinite repetition, and if we ask ourselves who created that first cause we understand that the first cause is, and it is, first because it is not the causes of its being of being, and second, that the first cause cannot be created, because as first cause it has to be and to be in pure act, because if it were in potency, or had potency, it could not be pure act due to being in potency and not in act, that is, the first cause, is about something that cannot be in itself caused by another because it is all that is and in its being it is perfect because it is the cause of all causes. It is, in Aristotle's words, an immobile motor. The immobile motor that is the cause of everything cannot be an efficient, material or even a formal cause, because all of them are contained in the things that exist. And it is immobile not because it is incapable of acting, but because it has no power to receive any change in its being. Therefore, the first immobile motor could be defined, well as Pascal said, the God of the wise men and philosophers, I prefer to say of wisdom, this God, in fact, 
is only a metaphysical philosophical concept developed by Aristotle to explain the cosmos. Thus, in the same way that I am the final cause of the first cause, I am in turn the first cause of my acts and therefore of the consequences of my acts in my present situation, and in the same way I am also the first cause of the consequences that will occur to me in the future because of my acts. This means that from the moment I take the reins of my present, that I control my present, I also control my future, a future where the type of person I want to be is already in action. Next Law The Law of Generation The Law of Generation refers to the fact that generation exists everywhere, generation manifests on all planes. Everything in the universe is created and the universe is constantly creating, and just as a baby is generated from the union of a man and a woman, so we generate our life. If in my daily life I am continuously generating evil, discord, criticism, envy, etc. I will be continuously generating negative causes, and that is why I will come to believe that everything goes wrong for me, if on the contrary it is good and goodness that governs me, things will go differently. In order to receive it is important not to forget that what you receive is always the size of what you give. Therefore, if we assimilate that in the universe there are two poles that are necessary, since the principle of generation tells us that when these two poles come together they create something new, and being that the principle of generation is focused only for the creative process, let us always look for the good and the good side of everything bad that is happening to us. And it is at this point, pausing, that I realize that if the mere knowledge of these laws has changed me, because I also realize that I am no longer the same as the one who started listening to this story, what would be the potential in my life if I apply the law of life? The law of life gives me independence so that I can build my own life in my own way, the law gives me the power to achieve prosperity and position without infringing on anyone's rights and opportunities, no need to step on heads to climb to the top. The law of life gives me the power to overcome my own weaknesses and shortcomings. The law of life gives me the gift of originality, for just as I am unique and unrepeatable, so are the things I do, and I have the ability to discover new and better ways in ways that are different from anyone else. The law of life gives me authority over the past and the future and makes me master of my present. The truth sets me free. For more motivational videos, deep reflections and philosophy, visit my channel where you can also find a wide range of videos on history, art and mythology.